Hey internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your hermeneutical handgun for surviving the zombie attack of liberal scholarship and philosophism. <laughs> and your favorite YouTube addiction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter AWESOME, the numbers Sweet Action, and Issues Etc. Talk Radio for the Thinking Christian. Issues ETC .org. Yeah. Oh, was I supposed to talk? <laughs> This week's text is Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39, and we are just kind of rolling right along, taking piecemeal Mark chapter 1, which is pretty sweet because it sets up everything that we're going to be looking at the rest of the year. I think part of this has to do, I mean, the slow going, has to do with the fact that Mark is a little shorter gospel and that much of what is going to go on in Mark we'll be looking at during the summer months where all the teaching of Jesus is, so they're kind of, well, going slow through chapter 1, as opposed to in other years you might move a little faster. But at the same time, Mark chapter 1's got a lot of stuff in it because of the urgency urgency of Mark. Mark ain't wasting any time with his words. It's like bam, 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 an action-packed book. One day there's a guy standing by a river and the sky bursts in half and God sends his finger down in the form of a dove. Well, sort of his finger, I mean his person, the Holy Spirit, and says, that guy standing in the water, that's my son. Next thing you know, that guy standing in the water, the son of God, he's facing off against the devil himself. And the devil's like, hey, you, you're just a man. And Jesus is like, uh-uh, no, you didn't. And the devil's like, well, just worship me. And Jesus is like, dude, come on. And then and the devil's like, yeah, but look, see, the Bible says so. And then Jesus is like, Psh, sure you can. And off the devil goes. Jesus walks out of that desert, points at a couple of fishermen, says, hey, you, boys, follow me. And they do, leaving behind, well, more or less everything they own. Although they kind of stick around a little bit, as we'll see. And reaching deep into his arsenal, Jesus pulls out his supernatural sniper scope, takes a little look around, heads into a synagogue so that he can pick off a demon, pulling him right out of the people while he's screaming, terrified, Jesus of Nazareth, what have you to do with us? Silence. Get out. You're done. My time is here because all this while he's preaching. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. That is to say, all the prophecy, all the promise, all the shadow, all the need for salvation going all the way back is happening right now, boys. God is in fact doing his saving, his reigning, his acting upon the world now, boys. Where? In who? Well, that's still a secret, but watch this because I got me some nasty can of divine authority to pull out. Bam, there goes the demon. What's this guy going to do next? We've only seen 28 verses of text. And immediately, coming out of the synagogue, they went into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And the panthera, no, 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 not the pantera, the panthera, the mother-in-law. Did you know when you were headbanging in high school that pantera really just meant mother-in-law? I mean, it is kind of a scary heavy metal kind of thing, you know? Yeah? Ding, ding. Hey, hey, don't be rude. The mother-in-law of Simon was lying there feverish and immediately, again, urgency, boom, 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 they tell Jesus about her. Because they're starting to put a few things together. They might not comprehend what his being the Christ means. They might not get that the kingdom acting is going to be a crucified God, but they know this much, Jesus has divine authority. So they tell him, hey, you know, my mom's sick, dude. Can you help? I mean, you can cast out demons. Can you handle disease? And going to her, he egerend her. Take Taking up her hand, and the fever afekend her. Now, why do I speak with these two words in Greek? Because these two words are going to be translated in kind of a normal, just kind of boring kind of way. Although it's kind of amazing because the fever actually does afekend her. But point being, these two words are not just normal, kind of boring kind of words, especially in the Gospel of Mark. Going into her, Jesus raised her. Now, English will often translate that as lifted up, and it can mean just lifted up. But here's the thing: Agarin is going to show up again in this book much later when three women on a dark morning go to a tomb where this same man has been laid dead for three days and he is not there but an angel tells them Jesus has been egerend just as he said he would. Now does this mean that Mark is actually saying that Jesus is raising Peter's mother-in-law from the dead? No, 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 contraire. What he is doing is laying something called a foreshadowing, a hint, a foretaste of what's going to come. And right in the context of this foretaste of resurrection to this feverish, bed-bound, nearly dead kind of ish woman is the fact that the fever on Jesus' word at Jesus' command
command a fakens that is forgives her. Now afeemi, which is what a fakens comes from, can mean a lot of different things. It's got a very diverse amount of meaning. So it can mean everything from divorce to forgive to leave alone to send away. So once again, I mean, it's a pretty simple, boring translation here. He picked her up and the fever left her as he did it. And yet there's this just amazing foreshadowing. He raised her and she was forgiven of her fever. And that might not even be such a big deal, except for that this word efeken is going to show up again and again in Mark, especially, especially, especially in this same pericope and then just in a few pericopes more. That is a few verses more. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Ah, hold it in the head. Ni? <laughs> but I mean, dude, the guy healed a woman's fever just by talking to her. I mean, this is just weird. Either this is like pure mythology, like they're just making this stuff up, or there's something bizarre going on, because this ain't no holistic acupuncture healing kind of thing. Jesus was no yogi. He says, hey devil, get out of here. Hey demon, get out of here. Hey fever, get out of here. The mother-in-law gets up and she begins to serve them, which is a very kind and thoughtful thing of her to do. <sighs> And if she's anything like my wife, I mean, she just can't help herself. It's like, sit down, woman, quit doing so much work. She's like, but it's dirty. I got to clean it. <sighs> I mean, it's a blessing, really. <laughs> but still. Yeah. And as it came to pass late in the evening, because of these two events, even at the setting of the sun, they, meaning the whole town, brought to him, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oi, so, ain't it gone? Huh? Exactly. Pharaoh means to bring. Really weird word because it's got a strange future tense, which is not pharos or something, but oiso, which looks nothing like pharaoh. And then you get to your past tense, it's even weirder because it's pharaoh, oiso, and then past is agnikon. And so you're like a new Greek student, you're like, what on earth? But not really that important. They brought to him all of the badly having, which you can interpret as being all of those who were sick, although it's a little bit more than that because it is the badly having and the daimonizamenus, as it says. You can hear the word daimon as in demon in there. All of the being demon possessed. So the town is bringing to him now everybody who's ever been sick in any way and anybody who's got any kind of issue who probably or could be demon possessed. Apparently this was no small number. We might want to kind of wonder about this in a world in which baptism is no longer being given to infants on a regular basis and a culture in which is declining into total debauchery. Maybe there's just a little more evil going on than we get to see. Don't assume the demon possession is like the paranormal activity stuff. I mean it's just as straight up as somebody who's just going to live for evil and have no problem lying. When you got people increasingly trying to reach the spirit realm and talk to spirits and divine spirits, divination, and practicing voodoo and Wicca and all this kind of stuff. I mean, just uh, just expect it's not as far gone as uh, us modern atheists like to think. Oh, we're so smart, there's nothing that can touch us. Oh. They brought him all the sick and the demon possessed. And then get this, as a result of all these people coming, the entirety of the city, the whole of the city was episunegmenein around the door of the house. Now right there in episunegmenei, you see a word that is the root of another word that we just had happen. They were all synagoguing around Jesus. God breaks out of the sky and says, that's my son. The guy who's his son goes into the desert, defeats the prince of all demons. The master of the prince of all demons comes back into the town and starts casting out the demons who are in the town along with all diseases that are with them, beginning in the place in which people are gathering in a religious way to receive God's word. And so powerful, so dramatic, so intense is his preaching combined with action that when he goes out of that synagogue, the whole people of the town synagogue around his house and ask him to act with authority on the basis of God's word for the sake of the inbreaking of the kingdom to fix life right now. And he does it. He gave them therapy. He etherapusened them. Well, that means he healed them. He healed many who were badly having, you know, all the people who had bad stuff and sicknesses, and many demons he threw out, and he did not forgive the demons to talk. What? What? He did not permit the demons to talk. He did not ain, which is from that me, which we heard is ken earlier. Forgive, send away, divorce. Because of Jesus, the fever forgives Peter's mother-in-law. Because of Jesus, the demons are not forgiven enough to be able to speak. Why am I insisting on this word forgive? Come back to that in just a second. He did not permit the demons to talk because because Dasan, they had known him. And this, for you Greek nuts out there, is a pluperfect. You almost never see these. What this means in the narrow is that he's not saying the demons coming to him right then had known him, but because of that first interaction with the demon who had known him, Jesus isn't even allowing them to get close enough to him now to say who he is. He just sees him coming with that supernatural sniper scope and says, bam, 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 cast, cast, cast. It's pretty sweet. I mean, yeah. 
off. That's nothing compared to what he was doing. And he was forgiving diseases, not forgiving demons. Why is this important? Because in just a chapter, after he continues preaching in other places, healing even more diseases like leprosy, he comes back to the same town, Capernaum, and the people gather around his house again, and it's so packed they gotta lower a guy through a hole in the roof, a paralytic who can't walk, to get him there. And Jesus looks at this paralytic and he says, son, your sins are a fit ain't I su hi hamartii. That is, I forgive your sin. This causes no small amount of disturbance among the people who have no problem with him casting out demons and no problem with him healing diseases and no problem with his preaching that the Messiah is now, that the time of fulfillment of God's salvation is now, that all the prophecies are about to happen now. But when this guy who's got this more than prophetically powerful voice box uses that voice box to forgive sins, well, we're not so sure we want that. I mean, only God can do that. Hmm. Jesus says to them, so that you may know that the Son of Man, the Messiah, has the power to forgive sins. By the way, who's the Son of Man? I'm not going to tell you. you got to figure that one out yourself. But just so you know that the Son of Man does have the power to forgive sins. Hey, you. Hey, go ahead. Walk. Take your mat. Go. And the guy did. At that point, they were all amazed. Stepping back then. So, he doesn't forgive the demons. He forgives the, the fever. The people are synagoguing around him. Early the next morning, he gets up and goes out to a deserted place to pray. And Simon and the others begin searching for him. And when they found him, they said to him that everyone is looking for you. They are all seeking you. Seek ye first the kingdom. Hmm. But, he said to them, let's go somewhere else. Not much of a church growth tactic there, I gotta say. I mean, where's his compassion for the lost? Hmm. Well, it's actually kind of there too, in a sense, because let's go on to the other markets, the other villages, in order that there I might also preach. Now get that. What's he all about? In Jesus' mind, what's the important thing? Not the defeating of the devil, not the casting out of demons, not the healing of diseases, but the preaching of the messianic revelation happening now. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. Let me confess rightly this word to others and not be distracted by all these other things, which are good, but they're just not the main thing. And so he went preaching in the synagogues, the gatherings, throughout the whole of Galilee, and casting out demons. Bam! 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 Cast! 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 As he went. I mean, seriously, yo. Mm -hmm. Pretty crazy stuff, and we're only 39 verses into the entire book. Whatever, oh so ever, will this Jesus guy, wielding this insane authority, do next? Mm. See you Friday. Bam! 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 Cast! Cast! Cast!